think about something new. So we all are very confident that we have the right economists, but still uh, maybe there are some questions to, to ask and to, to answer. So we invited um, a couple of uh, very uh, exciting economists to discuss this issue. On the background of some years, and you know it, um, where Germany, Germany's policies and Germany's economists have uh, got a lot of criticism internationally uh, for being too orthodox, too order liberal, less uh, um, active in responding to crisis, in the euro crisis, in the financial crisis, and so on. So the last year, maybe everyone has seen that that there may be a change in Germany. And we will want to discuss if this change is for real and what uh, international economists think about it. So uh, I already see Jakob von Weizsäcker is in the room. We will uh, have uh, Jakob and Anna Reich uh, in the room. That's something we always need to say now in Corona times, who's in the room and who's uh, on Zoom. Uh, so this time uh, you both are there, I'm moderating, so I'm the third person in, in the room. And then we will have uh, Anatoly Kaletsky from London, uh, Jean Pisani from Paris. Uh, then we have uh, Rüdiger Bachmann from uh, Illinois, uh, the Notre Dame University in the US. Very early morning uh, down there. And who did I forget? Um, uh, Nora Sesh, uh, Sesh also, uh, from, from Karlsruhe, from the University of Karlsruhe, um, very importantly. So um, I don't see the, the others yet. Are they online? Yeah. Okay. Excellent. So now I see you and uh, you see me probably on the stage. And I would very much like to uh, start with our two um, foreign uh, international economists, um, maybe the three putting uh, Rüdiger into that uh, basket um, from the outside. So I, I would very much like to start, have uh, Jean Pisani to start, and maybe you both can already come to the scene and then we have a hopefully very quick start of the discussion. So Jean, I don't see Jean, but uh, he must be there anywhere. Can you hear us, Jean? Okay, Jean is, is not yet there. So Paris is um, not yet there. So let's start uh, then with Anatol from London. We want to have an outside view first. Uh, I mean, we know you, you've been with us for, uh, at the last discussion we had on German economists, and that was very uh, hot discussion at, over, over dinner, I remember. So what is your take after this year and after all the discussions and things from Germany that you, you've seen on German economics? You have to unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, so what I wanted to say is uh, that post-war German economics has been very strongly influenced by a philosophy which I guess is the order liberal philosophy that emphasizes the rule of law and also the stability of laws. But the question I want to ask is whether necessary and healthy stability can mutate into a malignant rigidity and inflexibility, which is what I personally think has uh, damaged uh, German economics and German economic policy and Europe more widely over the last uh, 20 or 30 years. Listening to this conference, even here, several German speakers have mentioned that government debts, for example, must of course be repaid or at least legally amortized. But Michael Hubner earlier today showed us that amortizations by the different German states varied from six years in Sachsen 
to 50 years in North Rhine-Westphalia. So it's not surprising that variation from our point of view as economists, because we all know that in fact government debts do not need to be repaid and actually never are repaid. So why does German debate on fiscal policy still take it for granted that there's a need for consolidation? Because there are no valid economic or financial arguments for fiscal consolidation, we often hear German economists citing legal rules and requirements, the debt break, the black zero, the EU fiscal compact, and so on. And German economists often treat these rules, even though they're economically counterproductive or just out of date in current conditions, as if they're legally and somehow morally sacrosanct and impossible to change. And therefore, these constraints are also accepted without question, things like the debt break, by most German politicians, and I suppose by many German voters. And that, I think, is the biggest danger that we now have in German economic ideology. Because to make matters worse, a lot of these bad and irrelevant rules are actually based on even worse and much more outdated uh, developments or rules that went further back in history. For example, Christian Kastrop, uh, uh, Kastrop uh, said today that the debt break is stupid, but then he explained that it was a historically specific policy that was motivated by the 60% Maastricht Stability Pact limit. But that arbitrary limit itself was just as stupid uh, as the debt break, if not more so. Even in this conference, though, I haven't heard anyone apart from Eric Lonigan calling for that 60% Maastricht limit simply to be abolished or ignored. So we have a situation and have had over the last 20 or 30 years where German macroeconomic policy has been bound by rules and constitutional provisions which reflected ideas that were dominant 30 years ago during the negotiations in 1989, 90 and 91 that led up to European Monetary uh, Union. Now, I think we can all agree that the purpose of politics and also of economics is to design laws and policies that are properly adapted to the changing political and economic world as it really is. And in that respect, actually, Thomas, as you said, German politics and economics has done pretty well in the last few months. In response to the COVID crisis, fiscal policy has shifted rapidly and I think very appropriately from auto-liberal to Keynesian. That's also what happened back in 2008-9, uh, which m m very few people outside Germany even remember the scale of the fiscal stimulus and the timeliness of the fiscal stimulus that Germany applied then. But the danger now, I think, is that another sharp reversal to monetarism uh, towards back towards monetarism and fiscal austerity could happen in the next few years as it did in 27. And that after all was the cause of a period of stagnation in Germany and a crisis in Europe that almost led up to the breakup of the entire Euro and EU. Now luckily I think that kind of reversal is much less likely now than it was then. The European recovery plan I think is a very encouraging si sign that things really are changing in economics, German economics and politics. Christian Kastrop acknowledged that policies should now address the needs of the current situation and that this may change over time. He said that Germany now needs a breathing debt break and he called for the EU fiscal compact a stupid German idea to bully the weak countries. But isn't that also true of the 60% debt limit and the 3% deficit limit? And isn't this irrational German bullying also behind the prohibitions on monetary financing and debt mutualization, which again came close to breaking up Europe just a few months ago? They also reflected the economic thinking of 30 years ago in the EMU negotiations of 1990 to 91. So let me just finish by giving you this little uh, thought experiment. German economists, I think, should be the first to agree that democratic politics ought to be ready to change laws, treaties, and even constitutions that are no longer appropriate or misguided or even much worse. To see what I mean, imagine that we were talking here in Berlin 50 years ago in 1970. Would we then be arguing about how to reconcile our present laws and policies with rules, treaties and constitutions 
that were imposed on Europe by German pressure 30 years earlier, that is in 1940 and 41. Thanks, uh, thanks, Anatole. Um, I see that Jean has uh, come in. Uh, so please, uh, Jean, your take on the German economist. You need to unmute also. Yeah, yeah. Hi. Okay. okay. Uh, I'm very happy to be uh, with you and sorry for uh, the glitch. Um, I'd like to sort of take a step back from what Anatole just said and, you know, ask myself why is it that we're having this debate? And I think, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a sort of observation that German economists, German colleagues have been much more prone than, than US and, and European counterpart to defending market institution, being uh, in free trade competition, tariff autonomy, against government intervention, warning against uh, the risk of uh, moral hazards and uh, long-term unintended consequences of, uh, you know, well-intentioned uh, policy action. Um, considering that government are, governments are politically motivated or, or, or captured, uh, advocating therefore rules, uh, fiscal rules, but not only fiscal rules, rules in, in, in general against uh, harmful discretionary uh, interventions and not least criticizing stabilization policy as a departure from the principle that governments should be uh, establishing uh, markets but should refrain from intervening in the functioning of markets and you know there has been an evolution for sure i mean the, we we don't have today the same kind of debate we had uh, i don't know if you did decade ago with the german colleagues um, uh, and especially, we don't have the sort of cultural separation we had in the past where we were reading from uh, uh, different papers, different corpuses of, uh, of research. I mean, we all read the same papers, we all use the same method, um, and uh, many, many colleagues in Germany have taught or, uh, or are teaching uh, abroad or have studied abroad. So there is a visible trend, but nevertheless, these features uh, remain. And so the question is why? I know it's Michael Boda, I think, who said German economists uh, use uh, the same uh, uh, utensils to, to cook, but they cook different meals. And the question is, is again, is, is, is why is it so? So first explanation is given by Boda. Boda, in, in, in his short paper, says, um, this is because German economists are defending the interests of the German state and the German economy. So they see themselves as opposing those who want to solve their problems with, with German money. So it's just a reflection of the particular status of the German economy uh, in Europe. Um, we all influenced in a way by the, the way we perceive the priorities and the risk for our own country. Uh, and therefore, we shouldn't sort of, you know, consider that this, this explanation is irrelevant. But I find difficult to accept that um, it's a sort of the main motivation. And I think, you know, in particular, um, yeah, I'm struck by the fact that uh, in Germany, there has been very little rationalization of the particular role of the German economy in the European context. There has been no rationalization of the sort of leadership or hegemonic role of Germany because of this its economic weight. So, so I find it difficult to believe that this is the explanation for the different in attitude we see between uh, German and non-German economies. The second uh, explanation is that Germany. Waiting for a second. No, it seems quite rigid. Um, maybe we wait a second. But I, anyway, you can skip in again afterwards. I would then hand over 
to the US uh, and to Rüdiger Bachmann, who's uh, German and uh, teaching in the US and known for being very, a very moderating mind. Uh, so Rüdiger, please skip in and then we will ask Jean if he comes back, when he comes back to uh, follow up on, on his thoughts, please. Thanks, thanks Thomas for having me. Can, you, can everyone hear me? Yes, yeah, perfect. Yeah, thanks, okay, very good. Um, yeah, thanks uh, and uh, quick correction, uh, not, the University of Notre Dame is not in Illinois, it's in Indiana, but uh, I'm I actually see. sitting in the state of Michigan right now because I fly over country is not on everyone's mind, but uh, yeah, there is heterogeneity even in fly over country. So let me start by saying that um, what, a what a refreshing luxury it is for me to discuss the, the state of German economics. I think a country has, uh, is in good shape when this is the sort of an important debate. Uh, in my country, we are currently uh, worrying about uh, constitutional coup d'etats. Um, and so, um, so I'm, it's, uh, and this is much on my mind recently. So I'm actually happy to be here to do something, uh, uh, to going into a somewhat lighter debate. My second point I want to make is about autoliberalism, auto -liberalism, which um, has been much maligned and, uh, uh, in recent years, and I certainly have, been, uh, have given it my own share of criticism. I do want to say, though, a little bit, I think people are over, uh, over interpreting its actual influence, its actual importance uh, in, in Germany. Um, certainly in academics. In academia, it was never particularly influential. Um, it was, uh, it had uh, sort of bastions in a few universities, the University of Cologne, to a certain extent, the University of Freiburg. But those were not universities or departments that uh, were internationally terrible, terribly visible, right? So, so the, the, the academia, even within Germany, when you think of the departments that were leading, Bonn, Mannheim, there was never much, except for the early 50s, there was never much of autoliberalism uh, to begin with. So the really academically successful German economists, think about Martin Helwig, for example, Reinhard Selten, uh, recently Armin Falk and others, I don't want to name more names, you know, they have nothing to do whatsoever with autoliberal uh, tradition. So academically, it certainly hasn't been successful. And, uh, and you can see this, uh, the extent uh, to which uh, professors, autoliberally inclined professors, still uh, sit on, on chairs or get new chairs, I would say is basically non-existent, okay? So uh, they are even dying out. So not only have they not been terribly successful, I would say, I think in terms of academia, they are simply dying out. It's a demographic issue. In terms of policy influence, a lot of people argue that they had uh, some influence, but if you look into the details, you can say, and uh, Anatole actually made this clear, whenever there was a German crisis and the auto liberals won, policy went ahead and became very Keynesian when it needed to be anyway, okay? So it's not clear, just to give you an example, the Cash for Clankers program uh, about 10 years ago was hugely dis uh, criticized by some auto liberal stalwarts and you know the German government and the conservative German government just went ahead anyway. So I question, and by the way, this is the view of, for example, none other than Lars Feld, who is, uh, you know, perhaps one of the most visible uh, uh, representatives of autoliberalism. He basically says, we don't really have influence anyway, um, um, uh, in, in, in one of his reflections. Uh, right, right. So what is, if anything, I think the influence of, uh, or what, what is it about Germany and autoliberalism? I think autoliberalism is more of a symptom than it is a cause for anything. It is basically, the, the outflow of a particular German, German philosophy, I would say the Hegelian philosophy of what the role of the state is, okay? That's what it really is. And that Hegelian philosophy, and I've worked that out in, a, in an essay of mine, is really that leads to jurisprudence being the, the, the queen of the social science and the, and the, state, uh, the state sciences, which is very different from the Anglo-Saxon, uh, the Anglos. In other words, why is that so? Well, for Hegel, the state is sort of a, an entity in and of itself, right? That needs to be governed as the, the outflow of rationality that ne needs to be governed by rational laws. Whereas for Anglo-Saxons, and frankly, I have a lot of sympathy for that view, is the state is simply a means of free citizens to, to do something. And so if whatever it needs to be done is a discretionary policy, so the discretionary policy will be done. Um, and so it's not so much uh, about the rules. I will say though, 
in response to Jean um, when he says that the German economists have not been very receptive of US uh, or international economists. That is also, to be fair, that is also a little bit due to a selective view of what constitutes US economics, okay? US economics has their auto liberals, so to speak, right? If you go to the Chicago school, if you go to the Minnesota school, Penn and Minnesota, traditionally, they have been similarly skeptical about government intervention, about, uh, uh, you know, about the power of monetary policy, the power of fiscal policy. They are very worried about incentives, very similar to auto, -liber auto liberalism. And so just because the, the European left likes to listen to the East Coast, uh, the East Coast economists MI, from out of MIT and Harvard, and uh, to some extent Columbia and those play Yale, it uh, doesn't mean that there isn't an entirely different uh, U.S. Eco economics that is um, that is uh, housed elsewhere. Okay, so be careful when you say the Germans have been not receptive of U.S. Econ economics. U.S. economics is itself very variegated. It's uh, okay. So now that I want to go back. Uh, I want to get to the situation today. I do agree that the situation has become much more pluralistic, much more internationally uh, oriented. But I would say perhaps there's also, you know, a lot of it is, um, is appearance and, and, uh, and, uh, rather than substance. Okay, so I think what has happened is that it's true that we had, to the extent that we had, uh, the auto liberals had economic policy influence. And again, one might put a question mark on that, but to the extent that they had it and were an established sort of policy community and well-connected policy community, um, uh, it's true that they had a bit of a monopoly, okay? It is true that Keynesians and sort of more generally the economic left weren't well organized. Uh, there were known very few networks in Germany um, and that has changed, right? So now what we have, I think in Germany, and that's my perception, and you can see this very beautifully on, on, or not beautifully on, on social media, on Twitter in particular, the German econ Twitter, what you see is that we have now sort of an equally sized, if not bigger and more powerful, and more loud camp uh, on the political left, okay? And sort of what worries, and then now we have two camps, okay? We have sort of economists that clearly identify with a certain network of, of economists that is uh, sort of close to uh, obvious uh, party, parties on the, on the more left political spectrum, and we still have sort of the old uh, auto liberal uh, community in, the, in a broader sense, okay? Not all of them might necessarily identify as auto liberal, but as liberal conservatives. Okay, so what we have now is we have two of these networks, and my my uh, my worry is actually um, that we now have just two columns of dogmatism here. Um, when you hear you know uh, from the leftist network things like you know the greening of uh, ECB policy, the claims that there really are no budget uh, government budget constraints, that incentives and political economy con uh, constraints don't matter. Um, that uh, sounds to me just as much dogmat dogmatic and dog yeah, it's just an outflow of dogmatism as some of the old things uh, that the auto liberals said, which always said government debt is always bad. Um, you know, there's only rules in, in monetary policy, et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and sort of political economy is everything and macroeconomics is nothing. So I'm afraid that we just have now two uh, sort of ne two networks of yeah, essentially dogmatists uh, yelling at each other. Um, both on social media and more traditional media. And so what's, what's still, what I'm missing here as a more of an empirically driven economist, more pragmatic economist, is sort of the, the influence of the people that look at data that, uh, for, for example, we should just look at the recent debate on short-term work. Right? The, the, the political right was very worried about, about hindering Schumperian uh, creative destruction. We have no evidence whatsoever, I think, that Kurzarbeitergeld does that. On the other hand, you know, the left was, was uh, touting it and was defending it, that Olaf Scholz was already is extending it, uh, and it wasn't clear that it was really necessary already to do so. And so th there was no, all this thing was based on, on very little, all this debate was based on very little evidence, simply because, and this is part of the problem, I think, in Germany, uh, to make real progress in the economic policy debate, we have uh, the, the data infrastructure, the economic policy data infrastructure in Germany is still pretty, pretty bad, okay? So we don't even know uh, in real time how many short-time workers, for example, we have. And, you know, what that means for people, for, for, for women at home, for example, another big debate of how COVID uh, 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 hindered women's progress in the labor market. We have no data on this whatsoever, very few data 
on this uh, whatsoever. And I have to question whether this is partly politically uh, uh, motivated. The fact that we don't have enough data, a lot of people will then tell you because of uh, privacy issues, um, and there's certain, a certain point to it, given Germany's history, both through the former GDR and the Nazi regime. But basically, we have a, sort of, we have a politically at least uh, sanctioned uh, uh, terrible data infrastructure that doesn't even allow us to settle some of these debates more empirically, okay? And, and, and so that's, that's where I'm coming from. That's where I would like to make progress, that we have much more empirically grounded, much more evidence-based policy debates than we currently have. Uh, so again, we move from sort of one column of ideology, now we have a two-column two system of ideology, but sort of where the empirics, the evidence-based policy, that's, uh, that's sort of very much up, up, up to debate. There is some progress here. I know one of our panelists, Jakob von Weizsäcker, is a big champion of, of evidence-based policy, so that there's hopefully some progress. I also think that the, that the inauguration of Veronika Grimm and Monika Schnitzer in the Sachverständigenrat was a big progress. Those are two, two very empirically-minded um, minded, uh, economists. So that's, that there's some light but I'm not sure that, uh, that we, we have enough push in, in that direction. Lastly, I want to make two short uh, Nigga, remarks. You, you, you keep your time, please. You're very two, much very over. Two, very, very, two very brief remarks um, in, the ter in terms of state. I'm still worried or still not pleased with the uh, gender diversity, the gender representation that we currently have in economic policy debates. There's far too few women. Again, Mon uh, Monika Schnitzer and Veronika Grimm being on there is good but it's not, it can't certainly be the end of, uh, of what we're doing. And the, the second thing that worries me is the massive radicalization of some uh, formerly traditionally conservative economists, uh, political ra radicalization, where we have, uh, you know, uh, the, general, the former general secretary of the, of the Sachverständigenrat tweeting something like uh, that the Corona up is a Nazi up and where whoever has, uh, has had contact on this Nazi app with Tilo Zarazin or an AfD member will, be, will have to be sent into a re-education camp. So completely over the top, crazy stuff from people that had professorships and were, you know, uh, part of the economic policy advising establishment. And those people are, you know, loud on social media. They have their following. They try to influence from the, from the right wing margins. And I think we have to be worried about that, that they have influence. With that, I conclude my remarks. Okay, Rudiger. Thank you. Um, just to the others also, we need to be very short because otherwise we are six on the panel and we have a time restriction. Uh, Jean, you've found us back. So just uh, to finish your points, are you? Yeah. I can finish my points, but I don't know when I was cut off. Um, so if you could tell me. <laughs> Jakob so, says uh, you started to point. Michael yeah. Point, but well, maybe you, you switch to the, to the second part of what, what you wanted to say. It's no, but I, mean, I, I basically had, you know, there were three explanations for this particular attitude of the German economist. One is, uh, you know, the, the question of interest. Um, uh, and I explain why I don't think it's uh, so convincing that they're defending the, the sort of national interest. The second is a question of time horizon, that they focus on a much longer time horizon than, than traditionally uh, you know, people from other countries, especially US trained economists who are always the, uh, you know, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that in the US, the obsession with the, with the depression is always there. Um, and uh, so I think that's a sort of, you know, that's shaped by historical experience. Um, but um, that's something uh, on the basis of which we can have a positive, a fruitful discussion because we, uh, none of them, none of, none of us, uh, you know, wants to focus on a particular time horizon. And the third one is that I think German economists have a different view of the social role. I mean, you know, implicitly or explicitly, uh, people in the, uh, in the US, in the UK, in France, consider themselves as potential advisors to the prince. Um, in, in, in Germany, they tend to present themselves much more as sort of protectors of the market institutions against the prince and against the temptation of the prince to, to pander uh, to, to, to public opinion. 
Um, and so that's what gives his pronouncement saying, telling the politician, this is what you shouldn't do. This is, you know, this, this is something uh, that, uh, that's uh, you know, not uh, acceptable. I mean, they, some of the Zahverstenningenrat uh, pronouncements are just un un unimaginable in other, in other countries. And I think that has to really to do with the way the profession sees itself. Uh, what uh, Rudiger Bachmann said is very interesting on the politicization now of the German um, uh, economic community, uh, which, is, uh, which is worrying because I think we have all the responsibility of bringing something to the general debate that brings in the economic dimension. We all have political preferences and we shouldn't hide them. But nevertheless, we have something in common amongst economists in the way we look at, uh, uh, at the reality that's different from the way uh, you know, other disciplines, people from other disciplines or people who are purely politicized approach them, the, the, the situation from a purely political perspective, look at, at things. And I think we should, uh, you know, we should genuinely bring that to the, to the general debate. If we just perceive that being aligned with a, a camp or another camp, we're just useless. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's worrying. Um, let me just finish by saying that, you know, in, in the debate between um, German and non-German non economies, I think there's a, there's a lot to be built on the differences. Um, the fact that we have, uh, we have a different perception of risks, we have a different time horizon, we have a different uh, view on our social role, uh, bring something that's useful to the, to the discussion. Um, and by, by taking it seriously, by going far into you know, understanding what are the reasons, for example, in the European debates where we have a different perspective, uh, we can help address uh, the problems at, at a sort of relatively deep level uh, and avoid the temptation of the, the you know, papering over differences through political compromises that serve no purpose. Um, and I think that's what we should do, basically to sort of understand better what motivates the reservations or the different perspective of, of, of colleagues uh, and, um, and find ways of, of uh, you know, reaching a, a sort of deep, very strong, robust compromise um, that help address uh, differences by, by going far to addressing the, the, the concerns. Thank you, Jean. Um, I will hand over to Nora, uh, who's uh, an excellent economist working on behavioral economics, so not the big uh, macroeconomic questions, but all more, even more importantly, this year may, maybe on, in Corona times, we've been working on that. So very extremely excited to know what you think about the state of uh, economics in Germany, and you're very often in the US, so good place um, uh, to, to, to judge about this. Please. Yeah, thank, thank you so much for having me there. Um, my impression is that indeed this year uh, we learned a lot in Germany and we learned to adapt uh, quite fast and um, behavior economics is something that uh, originated in the German speaking area. Einhard Selten was one of the people who really uh, pushed for that already decades ago. Um, and my impression is this, uh, this has become even more relevant now in this crisis when we want to understand how to cope with it. And indeed, I mean, we can be quite happy, right? I mean, Germany seems to be at a quite good point at the moment. We were willing to try out things that uh, may be a bit risky, but trying to understand also how risky they are, like opening up the schools again that came with a big risk. We tried it. Um, so far, it seems to work so and so. Uh, let's see how, how this um, goes on with the winter and how we can adapt then to make and keep hopefully everything uh, safe. Um, but I think this already uh, shows uh, the willingness to, yeah, also in rule-based Germany. We discuss a lot now about what we want to have. If they can be low, they should be more you know, for the whole country. Um, but I think it's good we have this discussion and people seem to be quite happy with the measures we take, which is also a good sign. Um, yeah, but my impression is really this uh, human behavior aspect. This has only gained even more importance in, in this year. 
and um, the overall insight that humans are not homo economicus, that they are not fully rational, that they follow norms, uh, that they need narratives, um, that their experiences matter. This is something that uh, I think has, has also only gained importance this year. I was a bit shocked in the beginning of the crisis. I was worried, where is the European spirit? Um, my impression was it was a bit like, okay, um, this happens in China, so it's not so bad for us. We had never experienced such a bad pandemic in the last century, basically. And even when Italy was uh, in doom, it was like, well, this is Italy, this is not us. Well, that's at least my impression. And uh, I was very worried about the European spirit. My impression was in the beginning, it was very much, okay, what can Germany... <laughs> not so much, uh, what, what about Europe? But, but my feeling is this, this is changing and, uh, and I'm happy to see that, uh, of course, policy making is also getting there. I think it's, it's really important uh, that Europe does not fall apart uh, over that. Um, yeah, then, I mean, we have this long standing tradition that we need um, also a safety net, right? That our market society should be a social market society. This is a thought that we have had for such a long time. And, um, Although, of course, we made the safety net a bit, uh, you know, <laughs> it's not maybe as good a net as it had been um, some decades ago, but, but I think it paid out, really paid out, we have it. Our social stability is still quite okay. And if I look into UK or US, where you have these more, you know, market, market societies without much of a safety net, then I feel it really, it's really falling apart, right? And, and, and yeah, I think we can be uh, uh, lucky that we have this quite stable society, the trust in the institutions, and um, I, hope we, I hope we will keep that. And, and this is also what, what, what I would hope that we will push for that, uh, to have this good safety net. Um, yeah, and then maybe the last point, and this is also a bit to what was said before, um, I mean, this will be never possible to control tightly, I guess, but uh, I think we can be quite happy to have this uh, strong leader, Angela Merkel, who understands what exponential growth means. It may also be good that she is actually, um, you know, female. Yeah, we, we, the impression seems to be that uh, some diversity in, in the leading institutions can be quite good in this crisis. Um, also fits well to the antibodies you count uh, when you look into males and females. Uh, it seems to be that males are much easier to catch this virus and maybe more willing to take risks there. Um, so maybe this diversity pays out here too, that we were not willing to take too many risks um, so far. And I think this will be important for our economic prosperity in the, in the future as well. So thank you so much. Thank you, Noah. Uh, just one, one question. You told me about uh, the, the feeling that you got about uh, Americans sometimes now look a little astonished about how progressive you've been in this field and analyzing COVID and, and, and so on. Maybe you just just last sentence on that to explain. Yeah, that, that, that's, actually, uh, that's actually true. So I heard that, for example, from uh, Paul Roma, who says he wishes that the US would have been a bit more flexible as well and more willing to, um, you know, tease out what can be done and where we need to really put, put a limit to what can be done. Um, and uh, yeah. Uh, I, I guess it's a, I mean, when I talk to colleagues from the US, you know, it's a very weird feeling for me because typically they are in the super great position, <laughs> but, but this time it's really the other way around, right? Um, no, no, we are in a quite more comfy position and hopefully we, we will stay there, of course. Okay, um, thanks, very interesting. Uh, Jakob, um, Jakob from Weizsäcker, as chief economist of the Ministry of Finance, you've been economists with a lot of economists and uh, in responsibility this year, this very important year. Very important, very interesting to get your take on, on this discussion about the, the impact or the importance of German economists in the international context, please. So perhaps let me start by saying that in, in, in these past six months, my experience has not been that there's something, you know, very different about German economists. Uh, um, uh, it, it, we assembled a rather large, diverse group of economists, um, some of them based, uh, most of them based in Germany, some of them based uh, uh, abroad, uh, Udiger is one of them, 
um, to uh, uh, try and get economic advice in real time. And um, I think it was sound advice. There were sound conversations. The, um, people, sometimes they disagreed, sometimes they agreed, but the kind of cleavages uh, that uh, um, uh, some of you were alluding to simply were not there. They were not in the room. Uh, um, and I found that rather encouraging, and I think we got pretty good advice. Um, and so I think to some extent, uh, um, uh, um, uh, this session, this panel, is uh, about something in the past. Uh, and so, so to some extent, I, I agree with Rudiger on that. But I think it's still worth reflecting on what was it that made, um, in the past, German economics a little bit different. Um, I think it definitely was this experience of um, the Nazi era, the Second World War, and a new beginning. If you look at somebody like uh, Röpke um, and his view of the world, uh, his view of the world to an export extent was, you, you know, you, you can't trust governments, they go mad. You can't trust big business, uh, um, they, they're either bought or they're part of the problem. You can't trust workers because they want to become communists. Um, um, you, can, you can really trust nobody, um, and, and perhaps if you're lucky, there, there's rule of law, um, and, and, and it's a bit of a caricature, but, uh, but I can see uh, where somebody like that is coming from. Uh, I mean, he, in later in life, he became, I mean, if you read some of his stuff, it's, it's quite scary, but I, I still, I see how people shaped by this experience, and he was, he was a, a, a very outspoken um, uh, uh, um, uh, some uh, very outspoken against the Nazis before they got into power. He then had to leave uh, Germany, uh, lived abroad. So, so he, he got it right uh, at the time and came back and was quite disillusioned. And uh, um, and I think I think that's an important part of where the order order liberal tradition came from. Then I want to point to something uh, a second uh, um, important feature of German economics. And there is actually, interestingly, uh, an analogy with France. Um, Germany and France are non-English speaking countries uh, with a relatively large domestic academic market. And that helped uh, those countries. And it's true for France as well. I mean, I got to know some of the elder and more domestically oriented French economists while I was still in France. They were simply more domestic in outlook. Uh, and um, and that's different, you know, if you, if you are either an English-speaking country like the UK um, or Ireland or a small country like the Netherlands or, 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 or Sweden or whatnot, um, it, it, um, it, it's actually similar in Italy. Italy is also this kind of mid-sized country, non-English-speaking. We were simply lagging behind as a result um, uh, because much of the innovation happened in the English-speaking literature, the English-speaking journals. And, and that's an important factor, and, and, and it wasn't mentioned, that's why I, I want to mention it. And then there's a, a third factor that made German economics different, and I think that's by far the most influential today. And that has to do with the creation of the euro. When the euro was created, um, there was very pronounced awareness, and I think this awareness is, is actually uh, factually true, that when you create a currency union, you create a common pool problem for fiscal policy. It, it's true. Um, and uh, there was this feeling that politicians had promised that the Maastricht Treaty will resolve this common pool problem um, now and forever. Uh, and obviously it wasn't true. Uh, and, and there are many reasons why it wasn't true. Um, and uh, um, I think there's still some, even some younger economists, some economists not influenced by this sort of post-war experience, um, more internationally minded than the German economists perhaps in the 60s and 70s, but profoundly disappointed that the promise they felt that had been given to them with the introduction of, of the common currency somehow wasn't kept. It probably couldn't have been kept, but it's this profound disappointment. And so I would say there are some economists in the generation 50 plus for whom this profound disappointment, um, or perhaps I should really say 60 plus, this profound disappointment 
uh, with the way the euro uh, didn't uh, really turn out exactly the way they had imagined. Um, that is, is still quite influential. And um, when, when I was listening to Anatol, I think the only point where I was slightly worried in, in, in the things you said is, I think if we do not reflect on this common pool problem, which is there, of course in the context of the lo uh, zero lower bound, of course in the context of a, a, rapid, a rapidly evolving world, we will do so at a, our peril. And so I think we can understand why German economics was different. I think there are certain things we can learn from them. But frankly, I think to a, a, an important extent, the active generation of German economists has transcended many of the things that the session was supposed to be about. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Jakob. And uh, last but not least, uh, Anna Reich uh, from the Pluralistic Network of uh, Economics. So young students uh, trying to, to um, go against what uh, is perceived as a very uh, mainstream unified economic thinking at some point. So please, your take uh, on this question as someone who's uh, younger and uh, gaining in this in this field of, of an experience of uh, new economic thinking. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here. And when I was preparing for this panel, and also now I felt quite nervous because I'm the young economist, I'm the young female economist, and usually you have like a lower power position on such a panel, but it's great that you invited me anyhow. And I wanted to decide to try something new today. Usually I put on my professional face, I try to dress up, which I did, but I also wanted to take my heart with me today. So I'm speaking here not only from my mind, but also from my heart. And I'm my, my authentic self, which means I know some things, but I also don't know many things. <laughs> and I'm worried about things. And I feel insecure about things, but I'm also very, very, very curious. And I asked myself because for coming here, because you sent me the question, does Germany have the right economists to design the much needed new economic model? And I reflected on that beforehand and asking my heart and my mind. And what came to me was that the new economic model and the role of the new economic model that we will create is to be a midwife for a more beautiful world. And saying this right now, this really feels outrageous. <laughs> Economy and economics and beauty, they don't go well together, do they? <laughs> Studying economics and speaking of economic policies, I never hear the, word, hear the word beauty. And then I asked myself what qualities are core qualities of such a new economic system. In the last panel, somebody said we have to think backwards from the future. And that's what I try now. Core qualities for me, or the first core assumption, is that any economic activity has to be considered a subsystem of our planetary boundaries. That's not up for debate. That's just logic. And what are other qualities that we have to think about? For me, it's a quality of cooperation, quality of better relationships, better relationships among human beings, and also better relationships between nature and human beings. Because let's be honest, we don't produce air, we don't produce soil, we don't produce water, we live from it. So it needs to be a relationship that is more thankful and more appreciative of nature. And I want to ask all of you here also for the coming discussion, what world do you want to wake up in tomorrow? If you could design that world, what qualities would it have? What qualities do you want to have your, or to experience your children and to inherit? And what I think, coming back to what I said before, being nervous about talking here, we also need like the Copernican revolution of economic thinking and acting and discussing. Because for me, it's not about fighting anymore. I'm part of the pluralist movement. We had to fight against the old paradigm. It was like to be against something. For me, that's, that time is over. I now want to cooperate with everybody here. I want to get to know what, what, you, what gifts you bring. I don't dare say that even, but you bring gifts as human beings. You bring your knowledge, but you also bring your curiosity and your image of a more beautiful world. And that's what I want to do here, invite everyone here from that panel and everyone who's sitting here to get into cooperation and really find out what is our vision for this more beautiful world. And I think that's what we have to do and what I 
I had this feeling that there's like the forbidden fruit of beauty in economics because we have to cut off ourselves from the longing of our hearts. And this is like economic thinking is purely rational. You have to be objective, as objective as you can, but you cannot be objective without having a clear vision of what you want. And that's where we have to go now. I think, in my opinion, the old thinking is over. And the new thinking is not fighting anymore. It's not being against you, being against you, you against me, but it's working together. You have your own perspective. You have your own perspective. I have my own perspective. Why not share it? And why not combining it? And yeah, that's what I'm here to say. <laughs> and that's what, I, that's what I wanted to say to you. If I'm really honest, I think that's the time now. And I'm really, really thankful that, yeah, that you have built this platform and that you, for example, that you speak to young economists. We just had the talk with the Dezena Zukunft last week. I think all the young people coming into in the economic field, we don't only bring this, you're the old economists and we want to fight against you. We don't bring that. We want to work with you and we want to share the vision that we have and we want to hear your vision. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna, and uh, thank you for uh, the, the others. I, I think it's, I, I, I think I get the point and I, I think it's, it's really something that we need to think about. I mean, when we've chose our name, like form new economy, it's, it's yeah, someone, you may say, well, what is, that's very normative or whatever, if it's something which where you say new, or is it better or whatever. But at the same time, we felt also that there are some new challenges, some very big challenges that we can't answer with traditional economics. And that's, and then it's, that's, I mean, Jakob has been with us and, and, and for a long time. That's where we started to think, well, it's not about, we are saying that that's the new world. It's about searching for it. And it's the process of, of, of uh, discovering a new paradigm, whatever this will be. I mean, and, and that's something that I think it's very interesting that it's, you say that we try to get out of this old uh, this debate and, and, and old debates in, in Germany, and especially in Germany, where it was very harsh and there was a mainstream that it was very organized and very, uh, let's say, I mean, I wrote about that recently, like, like a, a cancel culture in a, another way that's, that has been produced and, and that has avoided too much criticism and this, the, old, the, the old circles. I think which is, what is interesting this year for me was also to follow the COVID-19 debate among uh, vir virologues and, and these scientists. And where you feel, okay, they also have some whatever personal ambitions or whatever, but the, the kind of discussion they had about how to approach Corona and how to find out the news and how is it working, I think that reminded me how what, what what's missing in economics, and maybe that's some just something to to throw in uh, and to 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 confirm what, what you're saying in a different way maybe, uh, and maybe we can can get uh, back. I'm, I want certainly. <laughs> Now we can back to the confrontation, but um, Anatol, um, are you satisfied with the <laughs> the answers of Jakob? I mean, we can't avoid. I mean, it's just to be honest. <laughs> it's, no, I mean, yeah. the, the difference is, I, I think, the, the very difference is, I don't, I think I would say that it's not about saying we're all right and it's it's all beautiful. Um, it's, I mean, the kind of discussion we have, it's, it needs to be, a, that's what I'm understanding, it needs to be a constructive uh, discussion, not something where you, you go in, that's what I remember, the old conferences, economics conferences, you know, you go into the room and, you know, all, everyone came in with what he thinks about economics and go out with the same, there was no, nothing moving, that's, that's what I wanted to, uh, want to achieve. So maybe, <laughs> in that sense, Anatol, uh, are you yeah. a little more convinced of the openness of German economics after having heard uh, some of these uh, contributions now? Um, yes, I am. And uh, I agree with um, much of what has been said. And I, I, I think drawing from Jakob, the, the thing that I find most encouraging is the generational issue, which I think is something that is observed, you know, has been observed throughout history. Uh, not just in economics and politics, but even in the sciences, you know, the, the famous 
comment by Max Planck that science progresses one funeral at a time. And it is true that, uh, and understandable, and I think Jakob gave a very good explanation of why there is a generation of uh, economists and also politicians in Germany who are sort of my kind of age, over 60, who feel that what has happened was not consistent with the promises that were made to them back in 1989, 1990 in, in, in the creation of the Euro. But what I'm also actually very encouraged by, Thomas, is, is uh, what Anna just said. And I think there's actually a relationship between what Anna said and Jakob and, and all the speakers, which is that I think we are actually on the brink of a regime change. We're at the beginning of a new era in economics and also public policy and political economy and also you know, society want to live now i thought that that new era i thought that that new era might have actually begun 10 years ago after the financial crisis the book at that time again you know it, it uh, bringing out some of the points that jacobs described uh, about these auto liberals that what the 2008 crisis proved was that we can't trust the private sector and also we can't trust governments, you know, not obviously at the extreme level of the Nazi experience, but there was a disillusionment with both the markets and the governments. And my view was that this was a crisis that would lead to some attempt to forge a new consensus, a new relationship between the market economy and the state economy between you know, the checks and balances that are required between politics and economics, between one person, one vote, and one euro, one vote, and that that would come about. Now, actually, it didn't really in, in the last 10 years. A lot of policies changed, but there wasn't a philosophical change behind it. I think it's possible that the COVID crisis coming 10 years after the 2008 crisis may be the catalyst for this really big transformation of a kind that we've seen before in the nature of you know, market economies. We saw it in the 70s and 80s with the great inflation. We saw it in the 20s and 30s with the Russian Revolution and the Great Depression. We saw it in the 1850s with the year of evolution, you know, the year of revolutions when Marx and Engels wrote the Communist Manifesto. So I think we are living through a period like that. And if we're lucky, the consequences will be the kinds that Anna outlines. And if we're not lucky, the consequences will be like the ones that happened in the 20s and 30s. Thank you. Um, I, I would like to ask Rüdiger, you seem a little puzzled. Is that because of uh, talking about non, uh, uh, non combative uh, economics? Excuse me, non combative economics? Yeah, I mean, you're, you're known for being quite direct. To combative. <laughs> I don't know why I have this reputation. Um, well, actually, I mean, I. I I guess I'm halfway where Jakob is. I, I, by the way, I fully endorse his argument about the common pool problem. And I, he's absolutely right. This hasn't gone away. And this, uh, this, can't, be, this can't be blasted over. So uh, I fully agree with him on that one. I also fully agree with him on the, the so-called Thursday round, the infamous, fam famous now Thursday round of economists that he has assembled. And quite, again, I can't thank him enough. And, can sort of give kudos enough to him and Wolfgang Schmidt uh, uh, for doing that. I think it's very innovative and these debates indeed have been very, very fruitful. I will say though that um, I don't think uh, everything is swell. Uh, in the following sense, it was relatively easy at the beginning for economists, even of very different persuasions, to agree on what to do in the COVID crisis. And I think it actually has to do with the particular nature of this crisis. While in uh, the previous crisis, the, the, the culprit, so to speak, uh, or the, the, the impetus for the crisis came out of the economic system itself, okay? And so then we have these big debates about, so it, already your di diagnosis of the crisis is basically shaped by your economic view, right? The, the, the libertarians or more liberal in the European sense minded people would say it's all the government giving these, uh, these implicit guarantees these bailouts to these banks, and that's why they take too much risk. 
etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. On the other hand, uh, the more leftist, more Keynesian, more macroeconomic types say, you know, it's all austerity, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you, so that you, ha you had to have these debates between economies. In this case, the, this this was the the, the the most exogenous shock that you could possibly imagine, I think, and that we have had in I don't know at least since I'm looking at the econ. Uh, uh, the the eco economy, which is admittedly not that far behind, so maybe post-war, right? It's a completely exogenous shock to the to the economic system. It was a complicated shock, but at the end of the day, we had the tools to analyze it. It was a combination of an uncertainty, liquidity, supply and demand shock. Everything was kind of in there, and we kind of knew what to do, and we did it actually uh, quite well. Uh, and uh, again, kudos to to the finance minister here for for act, acting from Jakob all the way to the to the, to the to the minister okay and even in the united states we actually did a decent job of uh, congress did a decent job despite the the man in the white house of dealing with it initially okay but now i think we are dealing with much more sort of own economics problems how long the short time work assistance yeah what do we do with uh, the uh, the decarbonification and stuff like that how do we redesign monetary policy? Those are the new kind of debates that we are having. And that's where we, where we already see that, uh, you know, how important is inequality with the increasing the pie and stuff like this. And that's where we see the old camps just coming out again. And if you look at sort of the fierceness of some debates um, in social media, I don't quite believe that we are in this sort of la-la land where everyone agrees with everyone. Um, and uh, so I, I view it, I, my, my worry is that Rather than having one dominant view, we now have two orthodoxies, basically, that just keeps yelling at each other. Uh, it's, and maybe not in the Thursday round, because people know how to behave there, but certainly over uh, media and, and traditional media. And that's why, just the last point, I couldn't agree more with Jean um, uh, when he says that we should, you know, we should really listen to each other and sort of understand why people have particular views. And I don't think, frankly, Anatole saying that a certain rule, 60% or 30% rule is stupid, is a good way of opening that debate. Maybe people had a good idea why they wanted to have these rules and just disqualifying them as stupid, um, um, I think is, is dangerous. If I can say for 10 seconds something about Anna, I, 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 I sympathize, I know where she's coming from, but I have to say that I will fundamentally disagree with her in the following sense. I, as an economist, in that sense, I'm in Hayekin actually, I'm strictly against design. I don't know that we can really design social policy all that well. We have a we have a problem of knowledge, a massive problem of knowledge. And from a democratic theory point of view, I'm also strictly against platonic uh, kingdom uh, um, uh, kingdom rules, uh, sort of ruled by platonic wise men. Uh, so I'm very glad that it's uh, Olaf Scholz who has to make the ultimate decisions. He's an elected official. And, and not myself or anyone in the Thursday round. And I hope this, I sincerely hope this will stay like that. So we need to be very modest as economists here and understand our role in a de democratic uh, uh, society. Uh, we, are ha we are happy to give advice, but uh, we should be very modest and we certainly should, uh, we should warn e uh, politicians if they think that they can transform a society by design. A lot of this is gonna be a search process uh, that uh, where we are going cannot be decided sort of uh, in the ivory tower. Okay, Anna wants to react. Of course, in a very non-confrontative way. But straight to what you said, Rüdiger, I think what you described happening on social media is a problem that you can describe in cultural philosophy, and it's called game denial versus game acceptance. It's the people who fight against each other being in their own paradigm, the one being saying that everything's right as it is, the other one's denying that stuff is happening or saying that the game itself is false or wrong. And what we need right now is game change. And that's what I was trying to say. A game change perspective means that you don't have to engage into the fight anymore. And the fighting means that I have to, that I have an opponent and I always put the same arguments against my opponent. And what comes from that? Nothing. And it's just not La La Land, but it's a really, Almost, uh, almost manipulative way, manipulative way of designing your your actions, and it doesn't have to do with any king or what you said. Your fear of who makes the decisions. I'm, I can understand that, but it's rather a question of a design of a process, not of the result. And that's what I think is super important here. And what I also want to say, 
<laughs> that we have so many solutions. Maya Goepel yesterday talked about wood housing. I don't know if anybody saw it or remembers it. The housing industry uses up to 50% of our CO2 budget. So that means our carbon budget, and that means we have to work on those solutions that are already there. If you ever heard about agriculture or thought about agriculture, there are so many solutions on regenerative, regenerative agriculture, such as agroforestry or centropic farming. I don't know if you know that, but there are systems. And we as economists have the opportunity, and also I think we have the mandate, or we, we have to do it. It's our responsibility for society to find the solutions that are already there and to incorporate into economic thinking and propose solutions, because in the end, it's a political decision-making process. But where do the ideas come from? And economists are asked to bring in new solutions. So we have to propose new ideas. Um, uh, could, I, could I just uh, uh, make a very quick okay. response? Uh, to the Anna to yes, Anatol, please. So, so, so first of all, uh, on the question of whether these rules are stupid or not, I, I actually wasn't, I was quoting, and I was rather surprised to hear that word myself from Christian uh, Kalstroth this morning, who was the designer of these rules. And the fact that he described them stupid, I did find encouraging because if somebody who has actually designed this and been a part of the process can now reflect on them and say, as you said, Rudiger, at the time they were probably reasonable but as applied to the current situation, they're stupid. I think that was, to me, a very encouraging indication of the openness, of the new openness of the German uh, economic establishment to new ideas. And the, the, the other point uh, I wanted to make was um, about this, uh, you know, this question of design, whether you're, as economists we should design. I absolutely agree we should not be in the business of designing. But in my view, just as we need market signals to constrain political design, we also need to recognize, and this was something that was missed out in the era of market fundamentalism, we need to recognize that at times political signals must constrain market design. And this is the kind of iterative process between markets and politics, decision-making through votes, as opposed to decision-making through spending, that I think needs to evolve out of either the, this crisis, or I think actually started revolving even out of the last crisis and what I call capitalism 4.0. Jakob, and then Jean and Nora. I really liked um, what Anna said. Um, and there's an interesting is, historical, um, analogy. The German Economic Association is called, um, I'm sure Rüdiger, you're a member as well, um, it's called Verein für Sozialpolitik. It's odd. Why do, don't they just call themselves German Economic Association? The reason is that historically, when it was set up, uh, the professors, and uh, I'm afraid at the time most of them were men, um, and they felt that the decisive question in society is the plight of the workers. And that's why social policy was key. Um, and I think in, in, in many ways they were right. Um, and they took a stand. I mean, they, they were probably good, good economists and good researchers, but at the same time they felt it is clear, it is almost self-evident that if you want to be an economist, I mean, at the time, you had to care about that problem. And I think the way I understood, at least I understood you, Anna, is by saying, well, if you want to be a young economist today and feel you can get away um, uh, um, uh, um, by not worrying about uh, things like climate change, um, you're not doing your job. And in, in, in many ways, you're endangering the legitimacy of your scientific discipline. And I think looked at, looked at it in that way, with this historical analogy, I think we can have great sympathy for what you're saying um, uh, and that doesn't mean, uh, uh, Rüdiger, uh, I mean, I, I'm in full agreement with you. Um, I think we need to be very, very, very aware that expertocratic fantasies are extremely dangerous. Um, and so we, we need to rely on democratic decisions to achieve the solution of our societal problems. And so I'm a little bit worried, for example, of some of the fantasies, I think you were there, um, uh, um, uh, trying to get central banks uh, without a democratic mandate 
uh, to try and solve the climate problem. Those are the sort of things where I would be uh, really skeptical. But I think the basic uh, uh, impulse to say, if we cannot give a good answer, a convincing answer, a workable answer to some of the key challenges uh, of our time, um, uh, sort of we as a discipline, uh, we don't deserve to sort of carry on. I think I think that is a very a very reasonable observation. Yeah, Jakob, but uh, may I intervene in, in that and defend what Rainer said? I mean, that's the, maybe also the question on the ECB because the auto liberal or the classical economists' answer would be they should be neutral. But in being neutral, they lock in old industries in a way. You know, they they do not uh, contribute to something which may be the big issue and the big con uh, big objective of the society that economists, as you said, may want to defend and in you know if they spend such let, a lot let me very briefly respond so i'm not at all against central banks looking at uh, some of their policies what i am against is somebody saying we can't get a majority in parliament now we try the technocrats and let them do what we can't get through parliament that would be a problem and i'm afraid some of the ideas linked to central banks are more of the latter nature and and that's something i think we need to be aware of and we need to be aware okay jean yeah i'd like to go back to this sort of uh, optimistic uh, assessment of you know the, the changes that have been in the german profession and the the nature of the debate we're going to have going forward i would object two things first um you know in 2009 also we agreed very much on what had to be done uh, in response to the immediate uh, shock uh, there was, I remember, you know, I was in full agreement with Klaus Regling at the time. And uh, he was a sort of a representative of, uh, of, of German uh, uh, thinking. Now, when we started to diverge, I'm not speaking of Regling, but in more, more general, was in the aftermath of the shock with the question of the pace of consolidation and the question, all the question having to do with banking union and the nature, the assessment and the nature of the crisis, whether it was a fiscal crisis at core or whether it was more a balance of payment crisis and, uh, and something that had more macro banking nature. And there we started having divergence that, you know, led us to the, the nightmare uh, we, we went through not being able to find, uh, you know, agreed uh, solution to the, to the euro crisis. So I think that I would caution against the, 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 the illusion that we won't repeat that. Well, I was in Berlin recently, and you know, it was not from economists, but it was more from, from politicians. I heard from everywhere that uh, the Schuldenbremse has to be um, uh, restored for 2022, you know? Um, that's not the current way of, of thinking in other European countries. So, so um, are, we, are, are we going to repeat this debate? Now, that's one thing. The other thing is the, the, the whole new debate that have opened about the, the green transition and this notion, this vague notion of strategic autonomy for, uh, for Europe, both having to do with, uh, you know, industrial policy and uh, intervention, uh, state intervention in the, the market uh, because we're dealing with externalities and the first best solution to deal with those externalities uh, is just not accessible. I mean, you know, we are we all as economists in favor of a, of a carbon tax that would basically send the right signal and leave to the, to the private agents to decide how best uh, to tackle this, um, this uh, problem. But it's not going to be accepted politically, neither in Germany nor elsewhere. And so we are much more in the interventionist uh, industrial policy. Um, and for strategic autonomy, we don't even know what it is, and you know they, they have uh, their, their, their different version of it. So I think this potential for you know a, a new divergence um, and a new difficult conversation between German economists and economists from other countries is there. Um, so we we should we should tackle it. Uh, we should um, you know we. Uh, we shouldn't uh, assume that we can't find solutions, but we shouldn't assume that we just uh, now, you know, because of a generational change, that's, uh, that's just over. I think so. Uh, Nora, would you? 
Um, yeah, I'd, I'd like to um, also comment on this um, atmosphere of discussion. And I think it's a really good sign that we, uh, you know, that we are starting to evaluate that, that uh, economists are asked, what kind of atmosphere do we have in discussions and are you satisfied with it? Um, and what you see is that many say, no, they are not satisfied. And then I feel this already initiated a bit of a change. Uh, and I hope this change uh, will indeed um, go on. And coming back to the diversity topic, it also seems to be that, um, you know, um, females uh, seem to be a bit uh, more worried even uh, than, than the males. Yeah? And, and as we get more and more diversity, this, this may, you know, um, just, just help to, uh, to push this more open-minded uh, con conversation. Um, Another thing uh, that I found quite remarkable um, and where I heard from US colleagues they wish they had a bit more of this open-mindedness as well is um, um, that uh, we had some influential German economists that early on in this crisis started to cooperate with, for example, people from, um, you know, experts who know how to handle infections. An example would be Maya Hermann working together with Clemens Fust. And very early on in the crisis, we had this recommendation, look, we have to keep the numbers down. It's not uh, having a, a economy on one side and health on the other. Yeah, we have to really cooperate here and keep the numbers down. And, and I, think, um, I think things like that are, are a good sign. Uh, and I think this is something that we really need to, to broaden up. Uh, we have to get open-minded and look into what the other fields have to say and cooperate. Thank you. I want to ask a very practical question and, and, and perhaps useful question to Jakob. You, it was quoted certain times now that you have installed this first day round of economists. Is that supposed to continue? Um, what is there some <coughs> some ex experience in other countries like like this? May Americans, or English people, learn or French learn from from this experience? Maybe you just say a word. I, I mean, I, I, I really think uh, we, we were just lucky. Um, uh, for the reasons that have been mentioned, um, it was a situation where a, a really new problem was there. Everybody was really interested. All the people we asked to participate, uh, they, they, they readily agreed to. Um, and it, it was a good and fair discussion, not shying away from controversy, but it was a very good discussion. And Perhaps I, you just say it's not but everyone yeah. knows what it is. Thank well, it's it's just a, a discussion uh, group um, uh, via video conference um, uh, organized by by the German Ministry of Finance, but uh, but Philip Steinberg is often there as well from the Economics Ministry. People from the Chancellor's Office uh, also listen in. So it's a it's 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 basically a real time um, economic advisory group. Um, and so far, um, uh, for us, it has been really useful indeed. Uh, and I want to thank everybody who participated in it. Uh, and it has, uh, I think, been fun for the economists involved. And, um, and the outcomes have been good. Uh, I, I share the prediction that I, as time goes by, um, a certain types of uh, controversies will reemerge. But just as a thought experiment, Jean uh, and uh, Anatole, if in your countries uh, um, you had a group like that, as time went by, I think controversies would also reemerge. So I'm not saying all is bliss and all is consensus in Germany. Um, my core argument was um, we've become very similar in Germany in terms of you know, what economists can deliver and what they can't compared to other countries, where in the past, and I think that's what motivated the, se the session, um, that wasn't entirely true. Um, and, and that's why I actually like that we finished uh, with Anna's remarks. Um, having become um, very normal by, by global standards, there's still certain challenges that concern everybody, whether they're German economists or not, uh, and certain problems that we need to address. Uh, and, and, and just to uh, um, answer to Jean directly, I think that there will be certain um, issues in the euro area um, between um, uh, member states. I think that's a fair prediction. Um, but I think um, an important part of it is not motivated by the economic advice they're getting, but it's motivated by the position where they stand and the interests 
as they see them uh, in government, uh, which is different from saying there's sort of an intrinsic um, economic bias in, in, in certain countries. So, so I, th I think that would be pretty normal too, that in the end, certain conflicts, they're not driven by, by different expert advice. Uh, they're driven by uh, different majorities and they're dri driven by differences in perceived interest. Uh, and that doesn't make it necessarily better, but in a sense, it's very normal. Thanks. Uh, is there a uh, Thursday round in, in Paris? Jean? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, uh, not, not exactly, but Bruno Le Maire has been uh, consulting very regularly uh, you know, a group of economists. Uh, so it was probably, compared to what I understand, uh, more directly with the minister and less with the uh, the ministry, uh, but but yes, there has been much more openness to to discussion with with economists and actually also quite a, a high degree of consensus on the nature of the measures that have to be taken in response to the to the crisis. Okay, um, perhaps just a last remark from from um, Anatol and Rüdiger. Um, maybe also from, from you, we have five minutes left. And well, we saw uh, um, there's someone joining us already. <laughs> well, I, I just, to, to, just to answer your question, Jakobs, I can tell you with absolute certainty that there is nothing like a Thursday round uh, in the UK government at the moment. And in fact, it's a completely the opposite. And I suspect this is true of the United States as well. Maybe Joe will make a comment about that later. That actually what we're finding in the Anglo-Saxon world is a complete, uh, a, a completely sort of zealous and fanatical monotheism where only one uh, point of view is acceptable even within government. And we've seen uh, in the British government uh, a number of very senior people being pushed out of even the non-political civil service part of it because they do not accept uh, the sort of fu fundamentals of the new government's ideology. So we've certainly moved in Britain and also I think um, in the Trump administration under America into a much narrower and much more ideological view which uh, allows no space whatsoever for uh, debates and conflicting opinions, even among professional economists. But Anatole, that's purely political. Yeah, yeah, it is, it is. I'm just saying that's, that's what's happened in the last year. I, I, I'm not saying, well, to some extent, I think it also does reflect what's happened to our societies as well. And I think Rudiger would confirm that of the United States as well. You know, we have become much more polarized societies to an extent that I would never but, have imagined possible five years ago. Yes, but the economic debate hasn't got more polarized. It was more polarized 20 years ago. Uh, oh, no, but I think that the, the, the difference is there was a debate. I mean, that's yeah. the problem. Yeah, now it's um, shouting. I mean, the, 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 the Trump administration has just no regard for for you know any expert advice yeah yeah it's not it's not it's not that we and and that this is i do think this is remarkable because i would say 20 years ago i mean even a republican cea uh, council of economic advisors for the german listeners had on them first rate economists whether you agree necessarily with their political and social philosophy i'm george sure, i'm sure joe won't but he can't deny that there were first rate economists on there like Think about Greg Mankiw, uh, uh, um, Feldstein in the Reagan administration. These were undoubtedly top-rate economists. So there were highly sophisticated economic debates. And sort of we, sort of in the US, we would look down at Germany where they didn't have these highly sophisticated debates. Now it's the exact opposite. We have them in Germany with the Thursday round. And I fully agree. And uh, I just want to make this clear. They are highly sophisticated and very fun economic debates. Well, we have nothing whatsoever like that in the United States. We have, uh, frankly, clowns uh, uh, in these, uh, like Peter Navarro and uh, and I forgot what the other names are. Uh, uh, Hazard, or Hazard. I mean, people who are terrible economists have no economic credentials. No, no. What's a Larry Cutler? That's the guy. Yeah. Uh, um, well, basically, business TV uh, media stars 
the level, just the level, whether you agree with the, pol with the political positions or not, but it, the level of the sophistication of economic debate has completely collapsed. Um, and this is not a Republican thing, this is a Trump thing. I mean, or a Republican Trump thing, or a new Republican thing, if you wish. Um, uh, I, we can only hope that under a Biden administration, should this happen, I'm sure it will, this would change. But the big question is, will it change? Uh, well, we will see in a month or two. Yes, thanks uh, very much. I, I, I would like to conclude in a, with a, thing, a thought about what we are doing also is, I think there is space for something new in a sense and avoiding the old debates because there are a couple of new challenges and it's not only climate, it's also about inequality, about uh, globalization, about there are different topics where there are no old camps really. I mean, yes, people are, or economists are always influenced by former economists or so uh, in, in, in a famous nearly uh, uh, slight, slightly adjusted uh, wording. Um, but it's like we need to understand, that's what I understand from people. This morning we had uh, Charlotte Bartels on, on inequality uh, and people discussing that, are, that you realize that they are about to understand what inequality is because the numbers weren't there. They are about to understand the drivers of inequality because we didn't know. And climate, I mean, there is no simple answer. There is, I mean, we're all searching for this answer and it must be new. It's not like it's just the markets or it's just the state, it's something new. So I think there's a lot of potential for these new debates and, and going beyond the old camps and, and just searching for something new. And that uh, joins what, what Anna has said. I thank you very much for all of you. Uh, hope you stay a little with us when uh, we have the next debate. We need to, to arrange seatings quickly. Um, Joe is already uh, waiting. We saw him. Hello, Joe, if you listen to us. And we continue in a couple of minutes as soon as um, uh, Finance Ministry Olaf Scholz, Minister Olaf Scholz will be there. So thank you, Jakob, Anna, Nora, Anatol, uh, Rüdiger, and Jean. And let's have the next discussion uh, in one year, um, as we had already. That uh, promises to be a, a more productive and again and again. So thank you. <laughs>